The following section contains many secondary sources in the form of anecdotes from North Korean defectors. While these anecdotes are useful to gain a general understanding of what may or may not be occurring within the country, it is important to keep in mind that they are not falsifiable, meaning there's no way to verify that these stories that they are telling are true and should be taken with a grain of salt. Women are flowers, says the popular phrase that originates from the northern half of the land of the morning calm. Despite culturally being a profoundly patriarchal society for millennia, when we look at the practices in which North Korea depicts its women, we see images of AK-wielding women in uniform alongside their male counterparts. Films starring women portray them as powerful, autonomous, and capable vanguards of the socialist revolution, but exactly how true to life is this depiction? Have the tenets of Juche effectively eliminated sexism within the country? The answer is much different from what any of us in the West can truly imagine. Throughout Korean history, predating the most recent division of the peninsula, Korean women were largely regarded as property. Young Korean women were often sold to other families in exchange for livestock, as payment for goods, or to boost a family's social standing within their community. Once married off, their purpose then was to give birth to as many boys as possible in order to continue the family line. When out in public places, unmarried women were expected to wear veils called tangot to cover their faces, in a way not unlike women in Islamic countries today. Korean women of the time had little social or economic freedom and were expected to be subservient to their male peers. And although Korean women in positions of power did exist in feudal Korea, Queen Sandu being the most notable example, this was reserved for the most privileged of women and was unavailable for 99.99% of the population. After the end of the Second World War, when Korea was partitioned along the 38th parallel, the powers that be in the North began to transform the roles of women to be more in line with socialist ideology. This included appointing women to various local positions within their community, such as village planners or leaders of their local inmenban, which is a sort of secret police slash community service organ. These policies proved extremely popular with women who were jubilant at possessing the ability to assume a role in their community for the first time. Furthermore, in 1946, the provisional government of what would become North Korea passed the Law on Sex Equality, which gave women the same rights as men regarding property rights, divorce, as well as prohibiting forced marriages. When Kim Il-sung assumed power and the DPRK was formally established in 1948, these policies were further expanded. Compulsory education was expanded to include women. Women were able to work outside of the home, and equal pay was strongly enforced. Youth organizations catered towards women like this Korean Socialist Women's League were established. Despite these progressive policies, however, vestiges of Choson-era discrimination remained. While not required by law to birth children, the North Korean government stated that women who chose to bear children were heroes of the revolution, and that women should conform to strict schedules established by the government to ensure that they spend time taking care of their home, as well as in their place of employment. This encouragement for Korean women to birth children was only exacerbated after the Korean War, when a devastated North Korea suffered a staggering 15% population decrease due to the heavy losses it experienced during the war. From this point on, many of the aforementioned policies were reversed or restricted, and women were socially ostracized if they elected not to have children. 
While at the same time, during the mass movement implemented by Kim Il-sung to insolidate his authority, known as the Cholima movement, women were compelled to work in various light industries such as nurseries, food production, and childhood education. These policies consolidated to ensure that women's duties to rearing children and housekeeping were intertwined with their professional careers. Politically speaking, women generally didn't make up a significant portion of senior government positions, with a few female members being married to other senior officials. Throughout the Kim Il-sung era, this practice would continue uninterrupted and for the most part was successful. Women would proceed to work in light industries while men worked in heavier industries and were subject to compulsory military service. For women, military service was never compulsory until rather latterly, although women could invariably volunteer. The ideal North Korean woman, as portrayed by government propaganda, is that of a strict stakhanovite, a stakhanovite being a term that originated from the Soviet Union for a worker who constantly exceeds their production quota. Additionally, she is a romantic yet chaste idealist who is unquestionably loyal to the Korean people, the Juche idea, and all that it necessitates, and nowhere are these traits more evident than in North Korean cinema. In the movie A Broad Bellflower, the female lead, Chin Sung Rim, is a textbook example of a stakhanovite, who works well beyond what is required of her every day to bring electricity to her small mountain village of Pyokgeri. Her love interest throughout the film, Wonbong, is disillusioned with life in a remote village and desires to relocate to a city with Song Riem to commence a new life together. At the film's climax, when Wonbong gives Song Riem the ultimatum to leave with him or stay in her small remote village forever, she does not relent. Despite her clear love for Wonbong, she prefers instead to stay in Pyokgeri. She spends her last moments in his presence tearfully admonishing him about how an ideal socialist must be content with the position they are given in society. She bids him farewell and returns to work herself into an early grave for the Korean people. The Korean woman's loyalty to the regime and the Korean people can also be seen in that of Ri Sol Ju in the film Song of Retrospection. Ri Sol Ju, a naval infantry woman, whom are affectionately known as Seagulls, is depicted as a strong, brave fighter who defends Korea and the revolution from the American invaders. It is during one of these engagements when she and her subordinates capture a handful of American soldiers, as well as a war reporter from the West. Throughout the course of this film, we see very clearly that the war reporter named Komak is deeply in love with Sol Ju. However, in following the party line on miscegenation, she uniformly ignores Komak's affection for her and passes it off as simple platonic friendship. And in the film's climax, she fulfills the role of an ideal protagonist in any socialist realist film by sacrificing herself for the revolution. <laughs> Of course, propaganda in places like North Korea is hardly representative of the daily lives of North Korean women. While women like Chin Sung Ryum and Ri Sol Ju assuredly existed, they did so during the Kim Il Sung era when the idea of the workers' revolution was still burning bright across the world stage. The reality is that most women today are broken into two classes, those affluent enough to be living in cities like Pyongyang and Wonsan, and those who live in rural communities. While these two groups are distinct in many ways, one shared commonality most women in North Korea have today is the disillusion with the idea of living as a vanguard for the Juche Revolution, and actively detest it as a sort of North Korean boomer culture and are instead more concerned with popular trends and consumerism like women in the West and especially South Korea and China. North Korean women like to wear jeans, grow their hair out, and purchase things like expensive bags or foreign cosmetics. According to an article written by North Korean defector Kim Jae-young titled Looking Pretty in North Korea, Taeyong describes the two different standards of beauty she experienced in the North during her time in the country. According to Cheong, when she was little, a woman's beauty was determined by how well she took care of her house and family. 
saying that beauty in the physical sense was something only pursued by the wealthiest of North Korean women. She recalls specifically that one of the nation's premier actresses, Oh Mi Ran, the woman who played Song Ryum in A Broad Bellflower, was renowned as a role model for North Korean women due to the roles she took as a chaste Takanovite who put her nation's needs before herself. As Taeyong grew older, however, she witnessed the emergence of South Korean trends and the effect it had on North Korean women of all social strata, which effectively eliminated the influence that women like Omiran had on the female population. Cheung indicatively recalls a time when the famous double eyelid surgery became extremely popular in the North. Despite being illegal, many women underwent the operation nevertheless through bribing licensed physicians or having the operation done at someone's house who may or may not be qualified to perform such an operation, which invariably led to botched operations resulting in serious injury, disfigurement, and even death. Cheung goes on to say that the surgery became so common that the government actually gave up on trying to discourage people from getting it done and reluctantly legalized the surgery, albeit with strict regulations in place. Another article titled The Roles of Women in North Korea, written by Lee Chae-sun for North Korean News, tells us more of the reality of women in the country. In the article, defector Chae-sun tells us of her experiences regarding discrimination in the country saying that despite the propaganda, patriarchy and sexism is still systemic in the country. She cites small customs and superstitions that exist within the country, like it being considered bad luck if a shop owner's first customer of the new year is a woman, or that a woman may be criticized if a man enters their kitchen for any reason. According to Chaesun, Workers' Party propaganda notwithstanding, a woman's role in North Korea is to take care of the house and should be unconcerned with anything that occurs outside of it. Furthermore, even though women were expected to work during this time, that did not absolve them from their duties to their family unit. Regardless of what position an ordinary woman held at her place of employment, her first duty was always to take care of her house and family. This policy towards the duality of North Korea's attitudes towards women can best be reflected in the DPRK's housing policy. Since the beginning, the DPRK has emulated the Soviet style of housing units. Where it differs from the Soviet model, as well as every other socialist nation, is that these apartments were never built for singles or childless couples. Housing units in the DPRK are exclusively built for families in mind. The only exception to this was the small dormitories for women who were attending university or who worked in factories. These women would live in these segregated dormitories until they were married. Although this practice has waned in recent years due in part to the arduous march and reforms by Kim Jong-un, in areas that still benefit from government construction, family housing is still the only form of housing that is available. When the glorious Soviet Union fell in 1991, it wouldn't take long for the North Korean economy to fall with it. By 1994, the nation's Stalinist economy was in free fall, factories shut down, the public distribution system, the system responsible for issuing food and other goods to citizens, had collapsed. With millions of North Koreans on the brink of starvation, the time came for women to step up. And step up, they did. With the PDS system all but disintegrated by the mid-1990s, the millions of North Koreans not privileged enough to live in major cities like Pyongyang, Nampo, or Wonsan suddenly had to fend for themselves if they and their families were to survive. Even though most heavy industries were no longer functioning, men were still required by law to report to work, and failure to do so could result in heavy fines or detention in a labor facility for repeated truancy. The women of North Korea were given more leeway, however, and many North Korean women were stay-at-home mothers who took it upon themselves to provide. These women did this in the only way that they knew how. By taking the skills they learned while working in light industries, women across rural North Korea began setting up shops called Tangmadan, which literally means market grounds. These were informal markets not unlike what you would see at a local swap meet or a farmer's market here in the western world. 
at these markets, women would often produce or smuggle their own goods, be it clothing, cosmetics, food, blankets, as well as other necessities, and would sell them for hard currency or by trading for other goods. These markets were technically illegal, but the North Korean government at the time tacitly approved of the Changmadang, albeit with regulations put in place, as it was one of the primary methods for the country to receive hard currency at a time when foreign trade was at an all-time low. This currency usually came in the form of Chinese yuans, or if you were lucky, American dollars. While the ability to be independent, earn money, and care for your family during a famine is obviously a good thing, this paradigm shift wasn't without consequences. For all of North Korea's history, and by extension all of Korean history, men were seen as the primary breadwinners, with women working on the side while also spending time at home. By the 1990s, however, things had changed. Husbands were now completely reliant on their wives to survive. This led to a lot of friction at home. With women assuming the head of the household, men were often seen as useless. Frustrated wives would often berate their husbands, calling them everything from useless eaters to guard dogs. This new sense of independence would frustrate North Korean men, who would vent their anger by beating their wives viciously, many times near to death for something like playfully flirting with the potential customer to entice them to buy something. Domestic violence is such a systemic problem in North Korea that, according to defectors, it really isn't even seen as an issue but as an expected result of any marriage. In the book Nothing to Envy, Ordinary Lives in North Korea by Barbara Demick, she tells the story of a defector named Miran, who describes her time with other defectors at Hanawon, and told her story about how male defectors were shocked to learn that it's in fact illegal to hit your spouse in South Korea. In an article written by Lim hyun Ju for The Independent titled, What Life is Like for North Korean Women, According to Defectors, she describes the relief that a North Korean defector had when her husband of 20 years had passed away. According to the woman, she had been physically abused the entire 20 years they had been married. For the millions of North Korean women facing a similar situation, there is virtually nothing that can be done. While women do have the right to divorce their husbands for any reason on paper, divorces are almost universally rejected unless there is evidence of infidelity in the marriage, as North Korea places familial harmony at the forefront of its values, meaning that so long as he isn't cheating on her, a man can literally beat his wife to the brink of death on a weekly basis with no repercussions. This has had such an effect on North Korean women that many choose to either outright avoid getting married altogether, or wait until much later in their lifetimes. In the aforementioned article written by Yi Che Sun, she writes that she witnessed so much domestic violence in her hometown that she and her friends wanted to avoid marriage at all costs. Another abhorrent injustice that affects women, particularly those who work in the Changmadang or are serving in the Korean People's Army, is the alleged rampant sexual exploitation of women. According to defectors, as well as from North Koreans working in China, it is not uncommon to be sexually assaulted, sometimes multiple times per day. According to a study released by the Human Rights Watch titled Sexual Violence Against Women in North Korea, several women give testimonies about the systemic sexual exploitation against women, with one woman, Oh Chung-hee, stating, On the days they felt like it, market guards or police officials could ask me to follow them into an empty room outside the market or some other place they would pick. What can we do? They consider us sex toys. We women are at the mercy of men. Now women cannot survive without having men with power near them. She further goes on to state that due to the inherent illegality of smuggling, there is nothing women can do about these sexual assaults except to minimize their chances of being noticed by guards by remaining quiet and out of the way. Further adding evidence to this is a 2014 survey of 1,125 North Korean defectors conducted by the Korea Institute for National Unification. 48.6% of the respondents said that rape and sexual harassment against women in North Korea was common. Furthermore, by North Korea's own admission, convictions for sexual offenses are all but non-existent, with North Korea voluntarily reporting to the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDA, that just nine people were convicted of sex crimes against women in 2008 
with the most recent reported year of 2015 resulting in just five convictions, meaning that there is a critical lack of attention and resources diverted towards bringing justice for women who are assaulted in the country. For women who are enlisted in the Korean People's Army, being sexually assaulted is an almost universal occurrence for enlisted women, according to defectors. Owing to the wide gender disparity coupled with the fact that men are often away from civilization for long periods of time. In a video interview with Asian Boss, a North Korean defector and former KPA enlisted tells of her experience with sexual assault in the army. According to the defector, officers who were predominantly men would always bring young enlisted women into their quarters at night to have sex. She further goes on to tell of a woman she knew who was being sexually assaulted for two years by her superiors before being dishonorably discharged for reporting it. According to the interviewee, before her discharge papers were put through, she managed to secure a Kalashnikov rifle and broke into the officer's barracks. She then proceeded to systematically gun down her abusers before turning the gun on herself in a tragic act of retribution. The already horrid situation for a woman who is sexually assaulted can become exponentially dire if she becomes pregnant with the assailant's child. As a nation that is still rooted in Confucian values, the idea of a child born out of wedlock is still a source of shame in the North as well as in the South. The fact that a pregnancy is a result of a sexual assault is irrelevant. A single mother can often find it hard, if not impossible, to find a spouse. She can then become an outcast within their own family as well as face workplace discrimination. As a result, it is allegedly not uncommon for pregnant women to seek ways to terminate their pregnancy. While the exact laws concerning abortion in North Korea are unclear and the information often contradictory, it appears as though abortion is illegal except for a few limited circumstances. The result of the lack of support from family as well as the state, women will often undergo great lengths to terminate the pregnancy, such as wearing a tight belt around their waist or rolling down a steep hill. One defector states that it isn't uncommon to encounter a fetus in a woman's restroom, especially so in the Korean People's Army. Despite the horrid realities that can befall North Korean women, these experiences that North Korean women suffer from aren't drastically different from what can befall South Korean women as well. Culture always transcends ideology, and many of the aforementioned customs, routines, sexism, and abuses also occur with alarming regularity in the Southern Republic as well. For example, even though domestic violence being illegal in the South, it is still a tragically common occurrence. Men taking out their frustration on their wives for problems at work or for dinner not being ready in time is commonplace on both sides of the DMZ, as is the sexual abuse of women in the armed forces. Access to abortion in South Korea is just as restrictive as it is in North Korea, as is the shame of having a child born out of wedlock. Because of this, many South Korean women choose risky illegal abortions like their northern sisters. The main difference between abuse towards women in the two Koreas is that much more of the abuse and hardship towards women in the North stems from the pitiful economic situation in the country on top of cultural values, as opposed to South Korea, where it is instead due to the cultural attitudes towards women in a country that too has not shed its Confucian identity. While South Korean women obviously live better lives than their northern counterparts, the purpose of sharing this information is not to attack South Korean men or South Korea in general, but to point out that much of the aforementioned abuse is tragically an issue for Korea as a whole, not one particular side. So what does the modern North Korean woman look like? While the economy under Kim Jong-un has noticeably improved, challenges invariably remain. The Jangmadang are still crucial to the North Korean economy, as well as to the survival of those living in rural areas, meaning that in many places women are still the primary providers for their families and can enjoy a larger feeling of financial and marital independence than their urban sisters. However, according to leaked market regulations, the Changmadang may be in trouble. 
In an article written for NK News, leaked documents show that Kim Jong-un's plans for market reforms include increased government regulation over the informal markets, including a clause that states that the local government reserves the right to take control of the informal markets at their discretion. Also leaked in the documents was a new rule that limited foreign currency exchanges to $100 per day. This news comes at a time when North Korea's economy, as well as its relationship with China, is improving, and may serve as a sign that Kim Jong-un is confident enough in the national economy to start rolling back the decisions made to allow the Changmadang to operate relatively unchecked. However, the COVID-19 crisis may also have something to do with the decision, as limiting interactions with foreign smugglers and the currency exchanged by them would serve to help protect the country, which has allegedly remained unscathed by the virus. Another reason could be that Kim Jong-un is worried about the implications of letting a free market go unchecked in a socialist country for decades at a time. Regardless of the reason for the decision, the rollout of these new regulations mean that women will face harder challenges when it comes to earning money to take care of themselves and their families. As it stands, the average daily life of the North Korean housewife isn't unlike what you'd see in a 1950s era coronet film. Her daily life includes making kimchi in the morning, taking care of the children and sending them off to school. Depending on whether or not she's employed or not, she may work until she comes home before her husband does and prepares dinner before his return before sending the children off to bed and retires herself only to get up and repeat this seven days a week. She does all of this, mind you, while ensuring her house is spotless as Korean culture demands. Once again, this isn't drastically unlike what you see in South Korea even today. Despite the hardships and setbacks, many North Korean women are finding liberation, even within the most repressive state on earth. As mentioned earlier, many North Korean women are financially independent, hardworking, intelligent individuals who are interested in many of the same things that you, a woman right now in the Western world watching this video, are. For young, affluent North Korean women, a surprising role model is none other than Ri Sol-ju, the wife of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. This can be attributed to the fact that unlike the robotic Oh Miran, who is the ideal woman for North Korean boomers, whose sole reason for existence is for the preservation of the revolution, Ri Sol-ju depicts herself as a soft, stylish, and kind woman of a political nature. These are appealing traits for a woman in a country that bombards them with unrealistic standards of perfection and loyalty. So what conclusions can be drawn regarding women in North Korea? While we can make assumptions based on what little information we have, we must remember that North Korea is a unique, secretive society that is unlike any other nation on Earth. With this in mind, it's impossible to fully understand exactly what the situation is with women in North Korea. While women in North Korea certainly live better than they did under the Japanese occupation and the feudal Korean dynasties, many challenges persist. Despite having laws on paper that guarantee women's rights and equality under the law, we know from the testimonies of thousands of defectors that violence against women, both physical and sexual, is rampant at every level of society. By North Korea's own admission, we see a nationwide failure to acknowledge the fact that sex crimes even exist. There is a critical lack of support for women who become pregnant through no fault of their own, and are thus forced into a risky attempt at terminating a pregnancy that may very well result in the death of the mother as well as the child. The worst fact of them all is that all of these grave injustices are being perpetrated against those who, by all accounts, saved the regime from collapse during the arduous march. The women of North Korea, women who, when all else failed, stepped up to when the government was not able to and provided for their families in the way that only sisters, mothers, and wives know how, through hard work, dedication, perseverance, and love. Whether it be dressing in stylish clothes, listening to K-pop, receiving plastic surgery, or simply working hard to provide a better life for themselves or their children, women in North Korea are no different from women anywhere else in the world. They are human just like us, and though they face extreme challenges every day, every day they will find the strength to persevere.